John Anik and Kenny Florian podcast. John Anik and Kenny Florian. I f***ing love them. I can't get enough of them. Let's hear that boss next. Big job there from Duffy and Frank Mir is hurt now. Oh, Duffy goes Duffy out cold. Frank Mir does it again. Rock em, sock em, robots here. Oh, my goodness. I can't believe There are a couple of absolutely self-involved bull****. Here are your hosts, John Anik and Kenny Florian. I don't know. I feel like I haven't seen you in a while. <laughs> Maybe it's only been a week. It's Monday, March 18th. The year is 2024. Hopefully everybody had a good St. Patty's Day, if that applies. A lot of people wearing green yesterday. It's episode 474 of the Anakin Florian Podcast, presented by DraftKings. What's up, Ken Flo? What's happening, kid? Did you do anything interesting for St. Patty's Day? Absolutely nothing. I did get out of the minivan business, though. I am no longer really? a minivan owner. So what'd you and get? That is very bittersweet. So I bought my wife a Lexus TX500H. So it's like a partial hybrid. You don't yeah. plug it in. But it's a fairly new sport utility vehicle. You don't see a lot of them on the road. It does have a third row. But I miss my minivan. You know, I miss 55 <laughs> bags of mulch in the back and you hit a couple buttons, the fucking sliding doors go back. So a little bit of an adjustment for me. But no, my wife was just getting sick of uh, of driving a beaten down minivan uh, to school with three kids every day. So we had to uh, flip the switch. I like it, man. So we did that. And that was very exciting. I did want to ask you one medical question. You know, a lot of people out there who listen to the Anakin Floyd podcast have procreated. And have children. And my daughter Tatum is in the other room right now. Poor thing. It's her eighth day with a high fever. She's got like 102.9, right? She's been to the doctor three or four times, right? Two negative flu tests, two negative strep throat tests, right? But they did finally put her on amoxicillin just because when the fever is going on for this long, maybe there's something at play. But this virus is not going away. So I know you're not a doctor. I know Dr. Gus Florian listens to the Anakin Florian podcast. Like, you know, at this point, we've stopped like the Tylenol and the Motrin because like we want to maybe let the fever spike and see if that'll like help her heal. But dude, like, right. you know, as a parent, eight days in, you know, to the doctor and back, like, yeah, Cody's right. And did she rub any dirt on it? What a fucking <laughs> asshole. Um, but dude, you know, when you got a sick kid, right, they say a parent's only as happy as their saddest child. So it's been a, a challenging week to say the least. Oh, man, I can't even imagine. Yeah, we, we've kind of been dealing with it. Uh, over here as well, uh, Ar- Archer, now my son, is kind of he, – he's he's in the clear. But we were dealing with something similar, even the whole family. I mean, my wife and I, we had norovirus. I don't know what the heck was going on. So that could be what it is because we were dealing with it for like two weeks almost, I felt like. And then sometimes you just kind of keep getting each other sick. But, geez, man, that's crazy. That That's a long time to be having a fever. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's – as long as it doesn't get like above that like 103, 104 range, right. that's where it starts to get like super dicey. But yeah, right. that's no fun. I mean, this kid's banging emergency and doing everything possible. Cody's wondering if you can put a kid in a sauna. You can to like 135, 140 degrees, but uh, I don't think I'm going to throw her in the sauna right now. But I do yeah. think it stands to reason sweating it out would help her cause. But we've been dealing with that. But nice to have a little bit of time off for the first time since I signed with the UFC in 2011. I have four consecutive shows off. <laughs> so Damn. I don't really know what to do with myself. I mean, thankfully, we do the Anakin Florian podcast a couple days a week, and that keeps me busy, as do the children. But they're on spring break right now, and uh, I don't think these long pauses are particularly good for me. I don't know if it's a mental health thing like Alexander Volkanovsky was talking about several weeks ago <laughs> when he doesn't have a fight on the books, but I don't know. UFC 300 feels a far time away. We're going to have more on that coming up later this week. We'll also talk to Trey Ogden. He competes this Saturday night. In Las Vegas, UFC Fight Night, Nama Yunus versus Hebos. Actually, who who has the marquee? Is it uh is it Rose or is it Amanda? Yeah, it's Rose. UFC yeah. Fight Night, Nama Yunus versus Hebos. So we do have another episode coming up on Wednesday. We'll talk to Trey Ogden. Richard Lee Ogden the third, actually, is his name. Uh, but a lot to get into today. Of course, we'll recap the shit out of Tui Vasa and Tabora and a lot of MMA headlines as well over the last six days or so that we would like to get into. Headlines brought to you by Cuervo. Now's a good time to enjoy the tequila that invented tequila. So a lot of different ways in which we could go, Ken Flo, for our lead story. But you know what it is for me. It's the king of Rio, Jose Aldo, ending his short-lived MMA retirement. He will face Jonathan Martinez at UFC 301 
And not all that far from now, Ken Flo, May 4th in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. So last MMA fight for Jose Aldo, August 20th, 2022 against Marab Dwalish Willie. He lost that fight, but he had won three straight fights prior against Marlon Chito Vera, Pedro Munoz, and Rob Font. And Ken Flo, the guy who fought you in his second UFC fight back in 2011. Getting back on the horse here, man. Pretty crazy news. What were your thoughts when you saw that uh, cross the news wire that Jose Aldo was coming back to MMA? Well, I was a bit surprised, right? Because, you know, you had the retirement announcement and then you had him uh, inducted into the Hall of Fame and rightfully so. Uh, that was an emotional moment. So it seemed like he was kind of officially saying goodbye. Like that story of him being one of the greatest fighters uh, in UFC history was behind him. But alas, it did not. You know, just when you feel like you're getting away, they bring you back in. Listen, uh, an event in his hometown in Rio, you know, that could be enough. But I also think that he has the skills to still compete at a very high level. I'm not sure he has got the skills to be a world champion again at the level he was uh, before when he was in his prime. However, this guy has a skill set that makes it difficult for any elite guy in that division, including the champion in a lot of ways. So, you know, I, it's kind of cool. And I also think this is a very good matchup. You have a guy in Martinez who's one of the best leg, ki leg kickers uh, in the division going against Jose Aldo, who's one of the best guys at nullifying leg kicks, blocking it, getting out of the way. He's one of the few guys, and I tell everybody to watch this. I remember mentioning it uh, when Israel Adesanya was getting ready for the rematch against Pereira. Watch Jose Aldo if you want to learn how to deal with leg kicks. This guy is an absolute master, a defensive master in a lot of ways. So anyways, it's cool. I, I love watching great fights, John. I love watching high-level mixed martial arts, and Jose Aldo is just that. So Jose Aldo had two boxing appearances, professional boxing okay. appearances. He was afforded the opportunity to partake in those, presumably by the UFC. Mm -hmm. It was April and July of 2023. And I don't think all athletes on the roster, Kenny, are afforded that type of opportunity, right? But Jose Aldo certainly has established more than enough goodwill. But it is a bit surprising, just given the Hall of Fame induction ceremony last year and all of the emotions to see him back. Now, certainly there is financial gain here, to be sure. I wouldn't be at all surprised if it's at least a million bucks to show. This is a pay-per-view that I think needed a little bit of a push. We will get to Steve even Ursag's championship opportunity here shortly, right? But this is a huge injection for UFC 301. And I don't know where ticket sales were at for May 4th, but bro, Jose Aldo's hitting that fucking tunnel in Rio in six weeks and I'm going like, dude, this stole the week for me. You it's know? so cool. And listen, man, like it's hard for a fighter, let alone any human on the planet is going to go, nah, nah, that's seven figures. Ah, I just don't like it. You yeah. know, like, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be something that's going to bring him back in Again, fighting in his hometown. So uh, very interesting. So uh, it's cool, man. I'm jealous of you. So our friend Aaron Bronstetter tweeted, for what it's worth, the rumor that I had heard was Jose Aldo versus Dominic Cruz. Aldo returns here to face Jonathan Martinez. So that is really interesting. Now, Dominic Cruz, if you follow him on Instagram, you can tell he seems to care more about his birthday than the average 38, 39-year-old man, right? I think that's part of the reason why Dom's not competing at UFC 299 and 300. No, he's one of my best friends. I say that sort of tongue-in-cheek, but... He has been training hard for several months now. He hasn't competed since the Marlon Chito Vera fight. And I would think that would be the type of fight, even though it's not a guy ranked above him, that would have piqued the interest of Dominic Cruz. So it's too bad they couldn't put that rumored fight together. I mean, could you have imagined, bro, Cruz and Aldo and Rio in six weeks? Such a cool matchup. Listen, Dominic Cruz has a different style than pretty much everyone out there. But with Jose Aldo's style, two very contrasting styles, very interesting uh, how that would have played out. But hey, who knows? Maybe we uh, we do see it in the future. I did mention Steve Urseg fighting Alessandre Pantoja for the title on May 4th. And we are going to have Ray Longo early in 60 seconds. But let me get to this first if I could. So we had our fighter meeting with Steve Urseg before he fought Matt Schnell, right? I'm doing it over Zoom because he's fighting at the UFC Apex. And my last question to Steven Urseg was, hey, if Alessandre Pantoja needs an opponent for UFC 301 on May 4th, are you ready, willing, and able? Now, this was before he fought Matt Schnell. And so I prefaced my question by saying, obviously, if you get a finish here and he got a spectacular finish and he said, yes, I would 100 percent take the fight. Maybe it wouldn't be optimal or ideal in terms of the preparation time, having traveled all the way back to Perth, Western Australia, and now coming back to this side of the world without having eight to 12 weeks 
resembling a championship training camp, but uh, this is the direction in which the promotion is going. And even if you want to suggest, Kenny, that Steve Urseg has not yet arrived at his fighting prime, he's one of the top 15 flyweights in the world, and I'm excited to see what he can do with the opportunity come May 4th. Well, it's a quick turnaround, right? And I think that for guys who have had I, I, maybe if there's anyone out there who has the stats on this, please check me on this. But for, for guys who have had like maybe eight fights plus in the UFC to have that kind of a quick turnaround, I'm not sure I would like that. Urseg is still early into his UFC career. It's not like he's been in a ton of wars. So, so to have this quick turnaround, I don't have a major problem with it so long as he's been managing the volume of work over the course of these last two camps. Um, so I, I think that uh, he seems like he's a very hard worker. He seems like he's a guy, despite the lack of a lot of like UFC experience, I think he fights like a guy that does have a lot of UFC experience. He's very composed. He knows how to put it all together. He's tall, ranging for the weight class. He's very good, not well-rounded. He's very good everywhere from what I've seen. Uh, and I think he poses a very interesting problem because of that to Pantoja. So, um, you know, I think he's lucky in that, you know, Pantoja's faced a lot of the elite guys. So he finds himself in this position after just winning uh, and looking impressive in his last fight against Schnell um, to, to get this opportunity. So who knows, man, he can come in here and surprise everybody. You know, uh, Pantoja, you got to give him the advantage at this stage of the game. But Urseg is no joke. Very, very skillful fighter. We will have more on the flyweight championship, presumed to be main event at UFC 301, Pantoja versus Urseg with the great Ray Longo in about 60 seconds. But as some of you know, the thrill and excitement of March Mania is here. And DraftKings Sportsbook, one of America's top-rated sportsbook apps, is giving new customers a shot to turn 5 bucks into $150 instantly in bonus bets with any college basketball bet. So right now, live on DraftKings Sportsbook, the UConn Huskies favored to win the men's tournament and cut down the nets at plus 400. You can also bet on who will win each individual region, such as Purdue plus 165 to win the Midwest. And North Carolina listeners, don't forget, DraftKings Sportsbook is now live in your state. Tar Heels plus 1400 right now to win it all. And of course, all of the UFC lines available for this weekend's fight night as well. So download the DraftKings Sportsbook app. Not now, but right now. Use code AFPOD. New customers can bet five bucks to get $150 instantly in bonus bets only at DraftKings Sportsbook with code AFPOD. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or in West Virginia, visit 1-800-GAMBLER.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On uh, behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas, 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario, bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See dkng.com slash bball for eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gaming resources. All right, time stamp it, folks. Let's get to the Ray Longo Minute. It's now time for the Ray Longo Minute. I want you to punch a hole in this fucking chest. That's what I want. The Ray Longo Minute. John Anik and Kenny Florian podcast. Hey, <laughs> you guys got too much energy for me today. I'm jet lagged and miserable. <laughs> well, you're early, so I apologize for keeping you waiting. Where are you today? Not on the, uh, no, the, I'm at the setup. I'm at, I'm at the gym. I got a lot. Of, I just hit the ground running, man. I don't know. It's the only yeah. way I know how to do things, but I got. I thought we were doing it at 1130. So I, I planned everything around that. Well, then you and Cody need to get your signals on cross because I tried to get ahead of the communication way last week that we were wow. going to be doing an afternoon show. And it sounds like that message never crossed your, your wake. Well, that would have helped. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, from now on, I'm going to send a group text to you and Cody. What is going on with your hair today? I, don't know. I need a haircut, man. I don't know. <laughs> My goodness gracious. All right. Well, how much time do you have? Do you have 23 minutes to take yeah, us to yeah, the top of the hour? All right. Let's go, man. So, Drakus Duplessis beats Robert Whitaker at UFC 290. And there was this thought process that maybe he would turn around nine weeks later in Sydney and fight Israel Adesanya. He was not healthy enough, enough to do that, right? He was walking on one foot, and he was not going to rush the training camp for the title fight, nor risk it. And thankfully for Drakus Duplessis, you know, Sean Strickland beat Izzy. The title fight came around in January, and Duplessis was able to win the fight. Steve Ursang taking this title fight against Alessandre Pantoja. This was somewhat on his radar 
albeit not in totality. Maybe a lot of people, Ursaig included, thought Mohamed Mokayev with that win over Alex Perez might have had the inside lane. What are your thoughts on Steve Ursaig taking on the five-tool player, Alessandre Pantoja, here just uh, you know six or seven weeks from right here right now? Now, look, I think this fight comes down to mindset. I really don't know. You know, obviously, Ursic looked great uh, in his uh, last fight. But look, some guys are going to react better on a quick turnaround. Some guys aren't. You know what I mean? And I think the guys that aren't, they're going to come up with something that they're not going to do it. You know, but uh, I think the excitement, and the opportunity and uh, Pantoja is definitely beatable. I mean, this guy has knockout power and uh, you never know, man. Anything could happen. I think. Uh, He's a, he's a tough kid, this Ursic, and he he might rise to the occasion. Uh, certain guys, like, again, it's an individual thing, but certain guys are going to thrive off of that, and certain guys aren't. And I, we'll see if he's the guy that thrives off, but he certainly has a good chance of winning that fight. There are so many things that go into it. Mohamed Mokayev's health could have been a factor, even you know, though he yeah. is screaming from the rooftops that he's ready to go. and sort of was upset that he got passed over. Mokayev's undefeated. Urseg already has one pro loss. Kenny, I'm going to throw it to you on this angle. I think for Steve Urseg and Brandon Royval did not have this going for him and Moreno has fought a million guys a million times, right? Steve Urseg has no connective tissue with any of these athletes, right? So short of him getting dusted inside of a minute, right? Getting Alessandre Pantoja on his back, rear naked, choking him in like two minutes. I don't see much downside for Urseg, right? You start your history, Kenny, with Alessandre Pantoja. And however it goes, however it goes, you could win the fucking fight. It could be an absolute war that people want to see again. But all of a sudden, this gets Urseg into that flyweight elite. And as long as he has a pretty good showing, he effectively changes his career, win or lose. What do you think about that angle, Ken Flo? I agree. I, I think another angle to consider is the fact that we don't know a whole lot about Ursic, right? I mean, um, we haven't seen so much from him during the fights. It's not like we have this 10, 12 fight report that we can uh, have a lot of intel on him. So I think that's an advantage uh, for him as well. I think for the UFC, they're also looking for some new blood in there to challenge Pantoja as opposed to, you know, keep making the same fights over and over and over again between the top two or three guys. So um, I think this is beneficial for a lot of different reasons. Um, and sometimes as a guy who fought in the UFC probably way earlier than I should have and then fought for the belt way earlier than I should have, in a lot of ways, having that ignorance can be bliss. You know, it's like I don't even I don't know what to know to even be nervous. I don't even know what to know to know how I should do against this guy. I'm just going to go out there and fight hard. And I think Urseg. Um, you know, with that composed demeanor and with his skill set, I think it puts him in a very good spot. Yeah, and John, look, I've been on the uh, I've been on the end, obviously, of being a huge underdog with my guys a lot of times, and certain guys just rise to the occasion, man. And he might be that guy. Like again, Kenny, we don't. What Kenny said, we don't really know a lot about him, but if he's that guy, Pantoja's going to have a fight on his hands, man. And again, he. You know, like you can't keep fighting a guy ten times. Like right. so, right. That, right. he's got that going for him. That the UFC does need new blood, and you never know. You take a shot with this guy; he does good, and next thing you know, he he's the guy. And the biggest thing that he has going for him that Drakus Duplessis did not is his presumed health, right? And right. I know a lot of people criticize Duplessis for not accepting that fight, but he really wasn't healthy enough to take it. Presumably, Steve Urseg is, and it's just going to be fascinating to see what he can do with the opportunity. All right. I want to read to you, Ray, if I could, a quote here from Anthony Lionheart Smith, and then we'll get into the, uh, the fight recap and recap your weekend. So this is a quote, serious XM satellite radio, light heavyweight contender, former world title challenger, Anthony Lionheart Smith. In response to Vitor Petrino calling him out, and that is a fight that will go down May 4th at UFC 301. Here's Anthony Smith, quote, I'm not done. I'm not the old wounded lion that's just pacing around waiting to be killed by the younger ones. That's not me. I refuse to be the new Neil Magny. That's three guys in a month and a half that have fought one and called me out. All unranked, all young guys. We're going to dead this right in its tracks. Call me a gatekeeper. Call me whatever the hell you want to call me. But here's the fact. I've been fighting inside the top 10 for a very long time and have been fighting in the rankings in two different weight classes for a very long time. And here's his opportunity against Vitor Petrino to preserve that ranking and sort of keep that gate closed, so to speak. Ray, what are your thoughts on Anthony Smith taking exception to some of these unranked fighters, calling him out because they think that maybe he's the most beatable guy in that top five or top ten? 
Well, look, I'll try to give it a different way. It's a compliment because they think he has a big enough name that beating him, you know, does mean something. So he's earned that right to at least get these guys to call him out. But he's by no means done. And uh, again, we saw it the other time with the who was but then he have a fight with somebody that didn't know his name, they said. And then he he went out there and he beat the crap out of the guy. So I think he's that guy that, you know, he's going to fight with a chip on his shoulder. And who doesn't like Anthony Smith? He's a stand up guy. Saw what he did even when he took the knee from John Jones. He, you know, he wanted to fight. He didn't want to. Right. Take a, you know what I mean? So hats off to him. I hope I just wish him the best of luck. But uh, I don't think he's an easy out for anybody. Kenny, the real meat of the quote didn't print, but essentially what Anthony Smith was saying is that why aren't these guys calling out Alexander Rockich, who is fighting Yuri Prohaska at UFC 300, right? Is it because they think that they can beat me the way maybe some of those fighters in the top 15 over the years felt like Neil Magny was the lowest hanging fruit, for lack of a better way to put it, right? Like, I do feel like some fighters take great exception to being in that gatekeeper role. Anthony Smith also has a big name. However beatable he may be, he's got a bigger name than Alexander Rockich as well. He's on TV every week. That, that's the key. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that for a lot of fighters that have been around for a little while, um, you know, every fighter kind of has that predator mentality. And when you have someone else's, that's someone else that basically sees you as food, um, you're going to be offended by that. You're going, no, 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 no. I still got it. I'm going to go out there and kick your ass. And I think Anthony Smith, I, I think that's a good sign in a lot of ways. Um, yeah. There is some risk, of course, right? Because there's guys that are looking at you as, you know, perhaps food, but more importantly, a way to raise themselves up and potentially get that ranking or to, in certain cases, uh, elevate your ranking. So um, I think Petrino is, is playing this uh, in an interesting way. Um, and I'm sure Anthony Smith has heard this before and is getting kind of pissed off about it. Yeah. Well, he got the fight. Yeah. One other thing, John, too, is, and, we, and we don't know. I'm just throwing this out there. I have no idea. But being a commentator, you never know. He might have slighted somebody somewhere said something about the fight, you know, and then that guy's pissed off at him for doing his job and then he calls him out. So I don't know that, but there's always that possibility because he's always in front of the camera and, you know, why, why people sometimes get right. mad at you. You just speak your mind. You try to do your job or me or Kenny or anybody. So. Right. That's not realistic. I don't think any fighter would ever be mad at a commentator for saying something like that. <laughs> I don't think that's ever happened. Never not happened, once. right, John? Not once. Not no. once. It's amazing. Yeah. No. It's just, <laughs> you know, for the guys, that they, the guys that don't fight anymore, I think it's a little easier and they still get called out. They're <laughs> right. not even fighting right. anymore. Exactly. So right. it, I think that's another possibility, but, but we'd have to go back and research that. So, Ray, what were you expectant that you would be asked about today on the Anakin Florian podcast? It's show number 474. We've done this essentially every Monday coming up on our nine-year anniversary the first week of April. What topics in MMA did you expect to be asked about today? Like, do you think a lot? Do you give a lot of forethought to the Ray Longo Minute? Well, uh, <laughs> sometimes I do, but especially you if I know. You hate my energy today, huh? <laughs> <laughs> No, sometimes they do. Today, I'm, I'm honestly, I'm jet lagged and I'm pissed off. I had a miserable weekend. You know, my guy lost and, you know, he just didn't do what he didn't even come close to doing what he does in the gym. And it was just frustrating as Dang. a coach to see that. And uh, I got to figure out why. I think he got compromised with the calf kicks early and uh, it just took him completely out of his game. And then and first off, hats off to Chad uh, Anhilgo. I'm not saying his crazy name. But Ann Helliger. And Helliger, hats off to him, fought a, fought a tremendous fight. He was fighting for his job, and it sure yeah. looked like that. You know, that's what my guy should have been doing, fighting for his job. And I think it would have been, you know, a better – I thought it was a great matchup, and he just didn't uh, just didn't go all way. But, uh, you know, those calf kicks suck, man. And, yeah. You know, it just took him out of his game, and I think that was it. In the gym, he was on fire. I mean, yeah. it just wasn't even – just didn't resemble what I saw. And it, as a coach, it's – it's frustrating. And I, and I really like the kid too. He's a great kid. And I got to figure out how to get him to, you know, go past some of those adversities. We all got to figure out how to pronounce his name. I mean, you just analyzed his fight for about 90 seconds and you didn't say his first nor last name. Well, I, I think I have it finally. It's Haralampos Gregorio. Okay. We actually have him saying it, but before we get to the file, so our esteemed pay-per-view producer, Michael Lappy LaPlante called me last week because 
these files, as we tell you folks every week, are open to interpretation. And I think there was a lot of dissension in the ranks as to how this name should be pronounced. Kenfo, wait till you hear oh, this man. fucking file. I don't even have a clue. I mean, my producer asked me for phonetics. I don't have a clue. But let us hear uh, Charles Lampos, if it is, pronounce his own name, Ray. Jara Lampos, the ferocious Gregorio. One more time. Jara Lampos, the ferocious Gregorio. <laughs> oh, wait, hold on. So, well, first of all, I had is it right. Is I mean, he Greek? Left out the He's Greek. Uh, but uh, that's his nickname. But uh, yeah, so they don't pronounce the C like the Brazilians don't pronounce the, the R. So it's right. Jara Lampos Gregorio. Pretty good. Kenny, can you hear, though, when he says that surname that quickly and rolling the R's, how difficult that is? To... Nick Papa Giorgio. Uh, yeah, I, uh, <laughs> it, 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 those Greek names can be tricky, dude. Very tricky. Yeah. It's Greek, right? Is it? Yes, yeah, Cyprus. Okay. So, so, so Cody Merrow, our producer, texted me that it was a tough weekend for you. Yeah. Was there any other reason as to why this was a particularly bad weekend or just we just talking about Jara Lampos? No, nah, we're just talking about Jara Lampos. Okay. I love All seeing right. everybody else, everybody. So, you know, I, I love going to the fight. Like, yeah. You know, I was talking to – who the hell was I talking to? Um, somebody, but I said, I just want to make a shirt. I don't know if this will make sense to you guys, but I'm just here for the sneakers. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. You know, you get that kid every time with this. Yeah. Like, I don't even know what you know, but whatever. No, it's all, it's always great catching up with people you haven't seen but no that that i like winning man i'm i'm really yeah i'm getting i mean i'm better you guys don't but i as a kid I, i'm a sore loser i'm not it's not good well we try to flip the switch on your mood here on the anakin florian podcast oh. i mean that's what we're here for you know what i mean whether you're home or at the gym or wherever you are bring that new fucking hip with you to vegas did you oh. huh yeah, I, right. I said this the other day. You know what it is? That pain was so great. I mean, I'm glad I did what I did, John, because the pain was literally a 12 out of 10. I mean, there was no question about limping through the airport. But because of that, man, I am so grateful and thankful that I could walk. You just take walking for granted that, yeah. man, I'm by, I was I got off the plane. I see I Quinta coming around the corner. I was like, I go, wow, I just can't believe I'm I'm bouncing through the airport like it's. It was so many, a couple of years of just even using a cane and just limping. And so it, and, and one way it was stupid, but on another way, man, I am so appreciative and thankful and grateful for something as simple as walking that, you know, I will never take that for granted again. It was amazing. We talked about those visuals of you going down those stairs and it very uh. much looked like a 12 out of 10, but he's back, baby. <laughs> We're back. That's one of big Ron Pellegrino's favorite sayings. <laughs> We're back. I'm back. I've been back the last week. I feel better than ever. All right. One other item I would like to get into with you boys before we get into Marcin Tabora's win and hairstyle. John Jones and Tom Aspinall had an interaction, I believe, in London, England over the weekend, and it has been all over social media, but I can give you the Cliff Notes version if you did not ingest it. Tom Aspinall with camera crew approaches John Jones, who was cordial, but not necessarily looking for big hugs. So at one point, Tom Aspinall puts his right hand on John Jones's left shoulder. Johnny Bone sort of shucks that off. Later, Tom Aspinall asks for a picture, maybe a stare down. John Jones says, no, nah, I'm good with the stare down, but we can take a picture. So I believe Tom Aspinall might be the best heavyweight in the world right now. He certainly deserves the John Jones fight, you know, um, but this was sort of an interesting interaction. I don't know if it'll be the underbelly uh, to an actual fight. Uh, but, Ray, did you see John Jones and Tom Aspinall come face to face for the first time this weekend? I saw the, I saw a picture of the two of them and, and Aspinall, I think, was a little noticeably bigger. Yeah. You, know, with, yeah. you know what I mean? I think that's the first thing I noticed. And I think John always had trouble with the bigger guys, at least standing up. But, you know, his wrestling's still on point. He's always been able to put the fight where he wanted to at times. So, uh, look, it's if he has to fight Stipe first, then Aspinall, how old is he going to be by the time he gets to that fight? So I don't know if we'd see the best John Jones. You know, he's not active, but who wouldn't want to see that fight? I mean, I think that would be a tremendous fight, but I'd be leaning towards Tom Aspinall at this point. Kenny, you got to love that Ray immediately took it to the mixed martial arts. And you are right. Tom Aspinall is fucking massive. Like when yeah. this dude walks into our fighter meetings, and I've only called a handful of his fights. But Kenny, you heard me say this a few months ago. Like the dude fills up the entire doorway. So I wasn't surprised that he was noticeably taller than John. Um, but what were your thoughts on, 
on those two coming face to face, Kepler. Yeah, it was interesting. You know, John Jones is such a competitive dude. Um, you know, he kind of has that F you kind of Michael Jordan mentality where he's like, I'm going to get it. I'm going to get the upper hand on you in every type yeah, of situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think it was really smart because you know, of not doing the face off because he's like, first of all, I'm not sure I'm going to do that. And, and number two, I'm going to keep you guessing at all times. I'm the one who makes the fights, not you. Uh, and everything is in my favor. Like yes, the yes. way he sees it, he's just. I mean, he's been doing this a long time, right? So he's yeah. a master at his craft. He's a master at the outside. He knows how this whole thing works, and he wasn't going to give Aspinall any advantage at all. So I thought it was interesting. I also think it's a sign of respect against Aspinall as well. You know, Aspinall is the young dude. He's massive. He's athletic. He's skilled. John Jones has been that dude. And, uh, you know, as the older lion now, I, I think that uh, he he's – He's a little bit hesitant or, or thinking about this whole thing, but I don't know. I mean, I, again, I, I don't know if the fight's going to happen, but if it does happen, John Jones is going to make sure that he's a hundred percent ready for that one. Yeah. Hey, I hate to do this to you. I got, I got to jump. I got get out of here. <laughs> get out of here. We got so much to talk. We didn't fucking need you today. I'll do it the minute man on the other side. Hey, have a great week. All right, better luck. Yeah, right. Week, huh? I'll tell. I'll tell. I'll, hopefully, I'll see in. Oh, I won't even see in Jersey, right? Uh, no, I'm not coming to New Jersey. No, yeah. thank you. Have fun, though. Have fun in Atlantic City, all right? <laughs> Cody, give me a two-shot. Give me a fucking two-shot, this guy. Get the fuck out of here. All right. We have so much to discuss today. Oh, Ray Longwood didn't want to be here, and that's just fine. First time in 474 <laughs> episodes, he couldn't hide it. So I love John Jones channeling his inner Michael Jordan, his inner Kobe Bryant, getting yeah. the hand off the shoulder. I think it stands to reason that Tom Aspinall is the best heavyweight in the world right now in mixed martial arts today. This has nothing to do with John Jones being the undisputed UFC heavyweight champion and everything to do with John Jones being the greatest of all time. That's what complicates things for Tom Aspinall here because you can't have the greatest of all time stripped of the heavyweight championship. Yeah, maybe he could vacate, right? But you do hope that expeditiously they can make the fight between John Jones and Stipe Miocic. Seems like maybe Tom Aspinall is going to defend the interim championship at some point in time. Maybe it will be Curtis Blades. But Kenny, the fan appetite for this John Jones Tom Aspinall fight is just through the roof. And the circumstances are just not ideal at all. If you're Tom Aspinall, you also have the consensus greatest heavyweight of all time, Stipe, muddying this whole thing. I mean, where do you feel like fan appetite versus promotional appetite is for Stipe versus John as opposed to Tom Aspinall versus John Jones right now? I would imagine that more people would like to see John Jones against Aspinall at this stage of the game. And and I would say that I would like to, if I'm being perfectly honest. And it's no disrespect to Stipe Miocic, but you know, this isn't Stipe Miocic in his prime. Um, you know, he's certainly at the end of his career. A lot of people thought he was going to retire. I think he had telling a lot of people around him that he was going to retire. Um, and I think it's the payday that's bringing him back. Now, it doesn't mean that we're not going to see a dangerous and capable Stipe Miocic. However, with John Jones uh, largely being considered the greatest of all time, we have this guy in Tom Aspinall. I think for the very first time uh, in a lot of people's minds, they're kind of scratching their heads going, I really don't know about that one. Most fights that John Jones is a part of, it's like, yeah, this is a dunk shot. John Jones goes out there and mauls the guy, or he goes out and wins anyway. Um, with this one against Tom Aspinall, you have a guy who is as skilled, who is as dangerous everywhere, and who's even bigger. So to me, I think that's the fight the UFC should make. However, they put it out there. He was supposed to fight Stipe Miocic. Both men had, had agreed to it. Both men want this. So now I think they need to let that one play out. So interesting, though. Two guys who have earned the right richly to manipulate the calendar are Stipe Miocic and John Jones. True. But it's really unfortunate for a prime, primal Tommy Aspinall that many people believe right now is the best heavyweight in the world. John Jones hasn't fought, of course, since the Seattle Gone fight. That was UFC 235, 285, excuse me, March of 2023. Stipe Miocic will be 42 years of age on August 19th. He hasn't competed since March of 2021, UFC 260. You're talking about 40 pay-per-views have expired since we saw Stipe on the proving ground. So there are a lot of different layers to it. Chief among them, the paycheck. 
second only to the opportunity for a guy like Stipe to fight John Jones. Potentially, they headline International Fight Week. But I think it's ambitious right now as we sit here March 18th to think that these guys are going to headline come June 29th. Certainly, Conor McGregor could factor into that equation. Um, But let's keep it moving as far as this heavyweight division is concerned. And that's why it's a long-winded way of saying I like that Tommy Aspinall went on the offensive and forced an interaction here. Yeah, this is what you got to do. I mean, if you have the opportunity and you've been calling this guy out, uh, you go out and seek him out. Literally, get in front of him. You know, see see what he, see what the eyes are saying, see what the body is saying, all that stuff. And again, with that potential photograph that didn't happen with the stare down, that was his juice to start to push that fight and see what the fans' response was. I mean, obviously they still love it, but I think that would have helped his cause that much more. All right, I got to give Ray Longo the benefit of the doubt. He did just text me, and it seems like he didn't know that there was a later start time today. So uh, my ire will be directed in some capacity later in the show. Never at Cody Bone Marrow, though, because without him, uh, none of this would be possible. All right, I would like to get into Marcin Tabora, and I promised I wasn't going to lead with his hairstyle, but I can't even talk about the fight before we sort of exhaust that a little bit. So... Marcin Tabor gets it done. They called it a rear naked choke. I'm not even sure if he was completely underneath the neck or what. We'll get into the fight in a second. But Kenny, what did you think of Marcin Tabor's hairstyle? I mean, this is something we have not seen before in terms of a man trying to combat baldness. <laughs> I didn't know you were going <laughs> to. I didn't know. No, we got to talk gonna... about this. All right. So. As a lot of our listeners and viewers may know, I've got (laughs) issues, right? I've been shaving my full head of hair, basically bicking it, balding it since I was like 14 years of age. (laughs) I have an identical twin. Obviously, I could grow my hair up, but a lot of people think I'm going bald, right? We all have our things, but I can't understand for the life of me why so many men are so caught up in having a full head of hair and going to Turkey and doing all these treatments for their hair and everything else, right? Ron Pellegrino wheels up to get a fucking hair transplant in Turkey, right? So Marcin Tabora is going bald. And so what he decided to do was like shave off half of his head, the side that's going more bald and do this like comb over thing. On the other half of his head, we have Marcin uh, Tabora addressing uh, his haircut. Uh, everyone is actually making fun of this hairstyle, and uh, <laughs> it's not a—it's not a big secret. I just got—I'm uh, just getting bald a little bit, and this this uh, side getting much more bald. <laughs> <laughs> so I try to keep some of, on the other on the other side of my head, and that's the that's the thing. <laughs> Dude, every man on deck, we need to protect this head. Get him off. We need to do whatever's possible to hold on to that hair. He's a fighter, John. He's going to try to hold on to every last follicle on that melon of his, dude. Dude, I respect it. I do too. Believe it or not, I actually support this hairstyle much more than going to Turkey for hair transplants or, or anything else, you know? And maybe I shouldn't even be speaking on this as a guy who gets his fucking back waxed, right? <laughs> But, dude, like, I actually support this much more than, like, a comb over that covers a bald spot on the back. I see multi-millionaires, right, combing over that bald spot. And I'm thinking, like, dude, like, just shave your fucking head, you know? First of all, you could be in business. You could donate your back hair. Number two, there should be a big tip. Right. Whoever cut his hair for being for having that level of creativity to be like, all right, so you're not growing the hair here. Let's just take the damn thing off. Is that cool? Can we just take just pretend that was just by design? And I don't know. I respect the hustle, dude. It's it's (laughs) and he's one and oh with the new haircut. So let's get into the win over Tai Tuivasa. You used some of your cash last week on Marcin Tabora at plus money, plus 110 to win this main event and uh, survive the early onslaught. Got a little bit battered and bloodied, but uh, experience, wrestling, grappling, submission ability. And uh, Marcin Tabora plucks off another one. Your thoughts on the UFC fight night main event? You nailed exactly why I picked Tybora, that experience, that wrestling ability, the the grappling ability, the positional ability. Um, That, for me, was what uh, made me a little bit more confident. Now, for for Petrie, like, he kind of scared me a little bit because he was so confident in Tuivasa to the point where he's like, I'm going to do a shoey. I was like, damn, what is he saying? Is he seeing something that I'm not seeing? 
there's like maybe a handful of uh, of MMA heavyweights on the planet that I would I would actually risk a shoey for. Like it's a division that is so chaotic and so volatile that um, I don't know. I kind of questioned myself a little bit. However, he was able to weather the storm. Tui Vasa is a knockout artist. If if Tui Vasa ended up finishing it by knockout, I'd been like, yeah, I could have seen that happening. But Ty Bora is resilient, dude. He's been there before. We've seen him hurt before and come back. Like I, I th- those are memories that I can't get out of my head. So that's why I kind of went his way. And yes, he was bloody. Yes, he was a little bit battered. But he went to his strength. He went to the easiest path easiest path to victory and he took Tui Vasa down he outpositioned him and he just took the fight right out of him it was it was beautiful that's what you do against Tui Vasa so Tabor has set himself up for another big fight a lot of people felt like if he didn't win this fight maybe he would have retired I think he's 38 39 years of age but again oftentimes after these fights there are more narratives or storylines when it comes to the losing fighter and Tai Tuivasa is a guy who's had so many shining moments then he reeled off five successive wins and now four consecutive losses for Tai Tuivasa where do you think he goes from here Ken? Gosh you know um, I still think he's got some fight in him you know I I think he had that passion. He had that drive. This is not someone where I'm like, man, Tui Vasa just gave up here. Tui Vasa didn't look very sharp. I, I don't see that. Mentally, he seemed like he was there. Skillful. He yep. just skill-wise, he needs more wrestling. He needs more grappling ability. He needs to, you know, be able to deal with the the takedown game. And there's a lot of guys in the division uh, who have a heavy grappling game and, and game plan. So That really has been the thing that's been holding it back. I'm not saying that he hasn't been working on that, but he is staying very active uh, for for a guy that needs to work on a specific skill set. I think this is one of those where you say, hey, listen, let's like let's put fights on the back burner. Let's not say yes to anything right now. Let's develop you as a striker and a wrestler. Go, let's go to the U.S. Let's get the best wrestler, wrestling coaches. Let's get the best wrestling training partners, and let, let's let hammer this home. Let's get our defensive abilities on the ground to the point where we can deal with someone like Tybora if he's on top. So I think he needs to take a little bit of time off to kind of reevaluate and, and – and, um, harden up those grappling skills. Yeah. There have been several training camps where – Tui Vasa has been in the United Arab Emirates. They did say on this broadcast that he had returned to his old team. So I think he's still trying to find the right recipe that balances business life and personal life. But I'm telling you, bro, and I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but Alex Pereira, Sean O'Malley, Brendan Allen, right? All these guys who are all in. When it comes to 24-7, 365, everything is about improving, getting different looks, wrestling and grappling maintenance, right? Breathing work. It's it's all in chips in the center of the table, 24-7, 365, en route to becoming a world champion. And Taito Ivasa was on that type of trajectory, and he resonates with the fan base to such an extent with his fighting style and the fucking Shui Vasa and everything else that if he could string together a couple wins, it's not out of the realm that he would find himself In a championship setting, but you do have to be all in. And uh, I don't know that he's ever going to be that guy. And that's okay, right? Like, I was the athlete who was fucking smoking weed in high school. And once I figured out how to navigate things with the opposite sex, I was a worse basketball player, right? Like, we all are who we are. But, you know, I do think that Tai Tuivasa has, if not championship potential, pretty fucking close to it. He's a great athlete, former rugby player. And, uh, you know, sometimes I just, I want to, I just didn't want to see him. Lose by submission round one, and here we yes. are. Again, you know? Yeah, you know, absolutely. You know, he, he's likable. He's got charisma. You know, he's a funny dude. So he he could be the full package. He just, you know, I, again, how much he wants to commit to this game um, is really up to him. At the end of the day, um, I, I think he definitely has that potential uh, to really be elite. But losing in that manner, round one, like you said, against uh, Ty Bora, who is very good, um, I, I think really hurt him here. You are right, though, in terms of his mental presence. I think the way he digested the loss after the fact, you could see how upset he was. I have no doubt that he put in a lot of fucking man hours preparing for this fight. But, man, that wrestling maintenance is just an absolute beast. And uh, Mm -hmm. it seems like he should be doing nothing but that, you know, in a lot of respects. Definitely. All right. Congrats to Marcin Tabor. I think I called his UFC debut in Croatia in like 2016, a loss to Tim Johnson and uh 
Still finding ways to get it done, so congrats to Marcin Tabora, and I cannot wait to hopefully call his next fight and ask him about the haircut. I think we'll have more on uh, Tabora's hairstyle coming up in our Wednesday program. Uh, But let us, if we could, get to the co-main event. It ends in a no contest due to an accidental eye poke. It was Brian Battle and Ange Losa. And I always want to give fighters the benefit of the doubt when it comes to getting poked in the eye. I think there were a lot of people who saw Losa after the fight kind of get upset and get animated in the direction of Brian Battle, who I guess called him a pussy. Uh, and then they all of a sudden say, oh, maybe he could see or whatever. You know, like, I don't think that uh, I want to get in the business of doubting as to whether yeah. or not a fighter got eye poke, but uh, certainly a disappointing end to this one, especially for Brian Battle, who's winning the fight. No question about it. And as a guy who picked Losa, you know, that was um, that was that was very interesting. I got lucky there. I I think that, yeah, it was not going well for him. I don't think he had an answer to the length and all the various tools that Brian Battle was uh, using out there. And Battle got frustrated and rightfully so. But you can't necessarily be mad at him if he did take an eye poke. Uh, I think it was clear he did get poked in the eye. It's not always clear, however, how bad it was. Only Loso truly knows. And I'll say this. Sometimes it's not that bad, but if things aren't going well during a fight, then all of a sudden that eye poke gets way worse. Um, yeah. You know, how would it, how would it have it been if he got eye poked and he was winning that fight? I don't know. Or maybe it was just bad enough that it didn't matter. It was like, hey, I'm in the UFC. I'm fighting the best in the world. I have one eye here. I'm good. I, I know when I need to stop. And, and you know, we all kind of have that threshold that we need to manage. Sometimes toughness can be your best friend. Sometimes it can be your worst enemy. And uh, each fighter kind of needs to manage that to the best of their ability. Um, but I, I, I think you're right, John. I think you do need to defer to the fighter that was involved, to the fighter that actually got poked in the eye. I can understand the frustration on the part of battle. Uh, but, um, you know, when you're the guy who kind of did the foul, it's similar to the Aljamain Sterling and Piotr Jan fight. It's like, dude, you're, you're making yourself look worse by being mad at Aljamain for taking an illegal knee. Like you're the one who threw it. So I don't know. Hopefully they can run this back, man. I want to get into that because for Angelosa, he immediately wants to run it back. And for Brian Battle, he kind of wants to spin his career forward. Mm. Now, I don't know where you stand on Brian Battle overall. Charlotte, North Carolina guy certainly seems to have a town behind him. I know you and I were both pretty surprised at just how big of a reaction he got sort of all week, right? But Kamar Usman on the post show suggested that maybe Brian Battle fight Kevin Holland, a guy who I think is number 15 in the world because he's calling for ranked opposition. I don't know what you think the ceiling is on Brian Battle if he's ready for ranked opposition. But if you want to fight someone like Kevin Holland, the worst thing you can do is is get up Angelosa's face and call him a pussy and give the UFC a bunch of reasons to fucking run this shit back and (laughs) show the B-roll from that in-cage interaction. So what are your thoughts on battle potentially as a top 15 guy or an immediate rematch between these two to sort of solve this business? Very valid point there, John. Uh, Yeah, listen, I think that... um I, I'm not sure I knew just how good he was. He looked great against Losa. He was all over him, man. And I think that you have a big guy that knows how to use those long range weapons takes advantage that uh, advantage of that fully uh he's he's known as a very good grappler as well um has been looking a little bit bigger and bigger almost every time i see him um and he's look he's looking better and better at, you know more skillful every time i see him so i think he's in the on the right trajectory for me just based on what he was doing against losa he definitely raised his stock in my mind and I don't know. I, I think that's a very interesting call out in Kevin Holland, who has a big name. Um, and I, I could see him winning that fight. Shout out to Kamar Usman for the suggestion. We'll see what they do with Brian Battle. And hopefully Angelosa is on the mend as somebody who's been wearing contact lenses for a while. And I'm no fighter, right? But dude, eye issues are the absolute worst. You know, I've been on a steroid treatment for my left eye twice in the last year. And uh, eye pain is really legitimate. And then you end up, you know, trying to fight through it and then you get punched in that eye things can go sideways pretty quickly but yeah when you say i can't see inside the octagon some of the fan base is going to suggest you're looking for a way out and uh you know kind of is what it is all right i want to get to one other ufc fight night related item by the way congratulations to ovin st pru tremendous performance at 40 years of age in getting past kennedy and zechiku by split decision 
But I have to talk about Gerald Mershark, Kenny, because anytime I am going to the UFC record books to look up the most decorated submission artists in UFC history, we come across the name Kenny Florian. Still in that top eight, man. <laughs> it just goes to show you how hard it is to submit people inside the octagon. And now Gerald Mershark, after he gets Brian Barbarina with the neck crank there in round two, 10 of his 11 UFC wins have come by way of submission. He has as many finishes in the UFC's middleweight division as does Anderson Silva, right? So say what you want about the body of work. I think 60 pro fights for Gerald Mershart, but into a tie for fourth place all time with Nate Diaz. 10 submission wins now in the UFC for our guy GM3. I love it, man. That, that That's so cool. I had no idea about that statistic that I'm still in the top 10 there, but uh, in regards to Mershart, man... Um, Really cool. I mean, this is a guy who, you know, when he's at his best, he he looks awesome. Like it's it was a clean performance, really, where there was no mistakes uh, that I saw. And he and he went against a guy in Barbarena who is very dangerous, very resilient, um, but he does have that vulnerability on the ground. And he fought smart. Um, talking about Mershart, taken to the ground, controlled him the whole time, never let never let Barbarena into that fight. Um, and he showed that he's got a high level finishing game. So I loved it start to finish. Um, it, it's why I, I like that fight. It's why I, I wanted to, to put my money on that fight. And um, he proved me right. And a lot of times you see the advantages and you go, this guy should win. Well, should win, you know, winning uh, when you should is not an easy thing to do in the UFC. You're, you're fighting against some of the most skillful, toughest guys in the world. And, um, you know, it doesn't always go that way. Mistakes happen. Things happen. Bad decisions to slip it on the octagon floor, whatever. But this was a clean performance from Mershard, who I think really wanted this um, and fought with that passion, just seemed very technically sound and, and got it done. The South Florida move has certainly paid dividends for GM3. Congratulations to uh, that gym. Killcliffe FC and Gerald Mershart. Most submissions in UFC history. Charles Dubronx Oliveira with 16. Mm. Jim Miller, wow. second place with 12. Damian Maya has 11. GM3 and Nate Diaz have 10. In a tie for sixth, Frank Mir and Gunnar Nelson with eight. And then there's an eight way tie for eighth all time. Wow. In terms of submissions in UFC history, and Kenny Florian and Glover Teixeira in that mix with seven submissions a piece. I mean, you're a fucking old man, right? Like you're old. Born in 1976. The only room I'm in now that I'm not the oldest guy is when I'm in the fucking podcast studio with you. <laughs> but still holding it down and it's amazing how often we come across your name still despite oh, the man. fact that you are dying. Fucking awesome. <laughs> oh, sorry. All right, if you're looking to level up your nicotine routine, Lucy is your answer delivered straight to your door. Lucy is 100% pure nicotine, always tobacco free. And not only can you choose your form, Lucy pouches, breakers, or gum, but you can also choose your strength from as little as two milligrams to as high as 12. If perhaps you've been underwhelmed by the effects of other nicotine pouches, you can also choose your flavor, mint, apple, ice, espresso, mango, some of those offered. One customer review says, quote, best nicotine pouches I have found feel and taste great. Couldn't be happier with my monthly subscription. Another user acknowledges receiving all day focus from this clean nicotine alternative. And don't forget to check out those Lucy Breakers, these one of a kind nicotine pouches with a tiny capsule inside the product that really sets Lucy apart. So let us help you level up your nicotine routine with Lucy. Go to lucy.co slash AF pod and use promo code AF pod to get 20% off your first order. Lucy offers free shipping and has a 30 day refund policy. If you change your mind, that's lucy.co and use code AF pod to get 20% off and always free shipping. And here comes the fine print. Lucy products are only for adults of legal age and every order is age verified. Warning. This product contains nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. And Ken Flo is definitely old enough to get Lucy if he so chooses. All right, we're going to go four wide right now as we welcome on Big Gun Brian Petrie, as well as my twin brother, the COO of Anakin Florian LLC, Jason <laughs> Anik. It's almost tax season. Oh, Brian. Cracking it. Getting after it. Getting after it. <laughs> it's tax season, and Jay's about to, like, dissolve Anakin Florian LLC. I mean, Kenny, all this fucking shit going hold on. Hold up. Hold up. J I'm here to see Brian. Big Gun. Yeah. What's up, buddy? <laughs> Are you filling, up? filling up the shoe already? Hey, I need to get after it. I've been, I don't, I'm not a nervous guy. I'm not nervous. I got nervous. I went to go buy beer yesterday for the first time in a long time. I tried to buy beer in St. Patty's Day. 
I got a Modelo, but there was no Bud Lights to be found. Yeah, sure, they had some big boys. I ain't going to check those uh-huh. big boys. Uh, yeah, and I got a Jordan Flight 3 here, size nice. 12. And uh, yeah, I'm ready to get after when you are. You, All right, you guys let are me doctors. step this up yeah, for the ahead, new listeners. Ahead. We've acquired a lot of new listeners and viewers over the past week. So Brian Petrie is not sort of rooted in sobriety per se, but you sure. haven't had alcohol in how long? Uh, it's been December 2015. I want to address that real quick. I got two DMs. Hey, no peer pressure. Don't break your sobriety. No, no, no. I'm not a sober person. I just don't like drinking. I never really have. Yeah. I throw up after like one or two beers. <laughs> it's just something that's not important in my life. Right. Uh, so yeah. that's what it is. What about recreational drugs? And you don't have to answer that question. See, Bruce Buffer <laughs> wants to be a role model. John Anik yeah. does not. Right. Okay. <laughs> so recreational drugs. No, okay. uh, I, I, I have smoked some weed in my life. It okay. puts me right to sleep. I'm more of a social butterfly. I like going out there, like mingling with the chicks. So I never really smoked weeds. It put me, put me right out and anything else after that. That's, that's just not me. So I'm pretty, uh, pretty sober. Dude, we, we can't find another sneaker besides a Jordan sneaker. <laughs> I think you're going to ruin hey, a Jordan sneaker. Hey, for hey, me. Hey, you know, I like um, it. Admittedly, I got I got a few pairs of shoes. Okay, there, all right, all right. <laughs> you know. So last week on the show, you suggested to the masses yes. that if Tai Tuivasa lost to Marcin Tabor, that you would do a shoey. Now yes. I don't want to be the hazing type and sure. force you to drink alcohol. Nobody no. asked you to do this. No. Um Jay, I think you maybe have a tweet that's gonna either live on the front end of yeah. this shoey or the back end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so Brian, a, don't worry. You're not going to yeah. catch a buzz off this. You're a big, you're a big boy. You're not going to catch so. a buzz off this. <laughs> so Petrie, I mean, yeah. you're everything comes out of your mouth entertains me. But right. this particular tweet, nine twenty seven p.m. March sixteenth during the fight card. Uh, yeah. Tui and I quote: Tui Vasa has the smallest nipples as a heavyweight, guaranteed. Yes. <laughs> Maybe even in the UFC. Those are mini Hershey kisses, <laughs> right? Am I what? wrong though? Uh, Listen, how did you, I miss it, that? That's a so, little. <laughs> Incredible, right? They're so tiny. not wrong. Yeah. But just shout out, shout out the tw- <laughs> Twitter handle at Pentameter9, DJ yeah. Skip Beats. He says, if this tweet isn't brought up on the Anik Florian <laughs> pod, I'll be very disappointed. So shout out. out DJ Skip Beats. You won't be disappointed. But PJ got comedy dripping for That's days. Good. That's why we want to make the build up to the shoey last sure. a little bit. I mean, his Give nipple- a little juice. I mean, this guy, the Green Goblin, going to buy <laughs> booze for the first time on St. Patrick's Day. Five of these beers going down the sink. Right, I have yeah, pretty much. I got a six pack, and no one else could drink them. I went to the shop down, literally in my subdivision. I have a little carryout shop, and the guy looked at me when I put the put the Modelo up there, like, "All right, let's go. You buying these for kids? I know. You're right. All right, let's go. All right, I'm doing so it. Pour Ryan in. Petrie paying off the shoey, and as someone who has done multiples of these in my life, just uh, you know, you want to start slow and yeah. control the volume out the side of the shoes. We're trying sure. to get as much of this beer into you as possible. Okay. John, last, no coaching. Thing, last thing here is, uh, and everyone's questioning it, yes, I got ID'd when I bought the beer. So uh, here we go. It. I know what you guys want. I know what you want. I haven't had a beer in forever. I can't hear you, but I'm going to make a mess. <laughs> All right. Here's Brian Petrie doing the shoey. Oh, I had a little drippage. Woo! Whoa. Oh, the beer oh, mustache. That. Damn, Pretty what good. a beast. What did it get? Over under seven and a half ounces down of the 12. Dude, he did that in like three seconds. What was I the got, I got about, I got about, what is it, 12 ounce beer? Yeah, I got about four ounces of that. It's all over <laughs> my chest. It's yeah. all over my chest. Right. right. <laughs> Well, we certainly, if you wanted to, uh, you could either show the world your two Ivasa nipples. You could go change. You could just do the main event challenge and do I'm your good. selections right I'm now. I'm good. I'm jealous of his nipples. I don't have two Ivasa nipples. I'm jealous. <laughs> so I think you should start uh, drinking again. Sure. My wife in your life. me to do it. Oh, I bet. Erica. Because uh, Brian in his 20s that drank, because I met my wife when I was 27, so I had stopped drinking at that point. Um, Brian in the early twenties when he drank was, was a hit. I wasn't violent. I wasn't mean. I was just a chill dude, uh, that got sick quite a bit and did dumb things. So there you go. So this is all, this is all making me want to drink. I know Kenny, we have a lot of content to do today. I wish I had a bottle of Cuervo. Shout there out. We go. Here we go. So I have Jim beam and I have puncher's chance. So we're going to put the puncher's chance down there. That's Kenpo's Aww. stuff. That's Kenpo's stuff. <laughs> I like stuff. this. I like this. But, dude, how about you, like, at, tell him, Peach, oh, you should start drinking again. I mean, that's, what a clown. That's a joke. What a clown. Right? No, 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 that because, 
You want to go ahead, Jay? <laughs> at, 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 at Boston Anik. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> with your stupid fucking blue microphone. By the way, the studio <laughs> broke today, too. So, Jesus. no, I, people are sliding into his DMs and saying, you know, don't break your sobriety. Yeah, so I am I making sober. a joke on the other side of it. Right. Understood. Understood. But I'm going to drink some gin to right now. Can we get back to Tui Voss's nipples? I'm really <laughs> curious. Yeah. Because, so is this a higher evolution of man? Because what the hell do we have nipples for anyway? They're, they're slowly disappearing. So I think Tui Vasa is a more evolved human, right? It's like, he, uh, he's like, I don't need these things. His body's like, no, we're going to make them <laughs> as small as possible. They're going to disappear in like another 10,000 years. I mean, they're right? incredible. With but his dude, body type being a little gotta, loose. And yeah, tiny, just jealous, man. But gotta love Petrie putting something on the line, right? Like you did back in the day, John, with that tattoo bet. I'll never forget sitting with John watching McGregor. Yeah, like <laughs> absolutely, Nate was winning. Like no question. Look at this fucking clown to my left. Like you could be sure. Diaz was winning that night, right, Johnny? So, Peachy, you sort of knew when you put it out there, right? Like, I wouldn't yeah. be surprised if you had uh, some action going the other way in the book because you knew it was coming, no? Right. I had money on tie by knockout, but I didn't. I did not hedge my bets. I did text Cody on Saturday. I said, "Listen, I put that out there. Win, tie, win or lose, I'm going to do a shoey. I mean, I can't <laughs> say it. that and not do it. I was going to come through. Um, I did not like drinking that beer out of the shoe. I'm gonna go ahead and set that. It's probably not gonna be. But I'm not gonna do that very often. <laughs> Brian, do you think you'd retain your job if you walked in with that Marching Tabora haircut? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, so, uh, yeah, I could do that. Easy. So how much would I have to pay you to get one of those Tabora haircuts? And how long would I have to keep it? Could I just cut it once and let it grow out? Yep. Um, I'd have to. Bro, he was willing to get the damage across his <laughs> yeah. chest for 25 grand. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'll, 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 honestly, John, I'll say 500 bucks. And has your price gone down on the... Damage tattoo. Bet. Well, my wife usually <laughs> lets me do whatever I want. My wife is my my ride or die rock. Right. She got mad at me, so the price has gone up. On the damage. <laughs> okay. <laughs> she <laughs> said, "I can't. I can't." She's like, "I can't, Brian. You, I can't." <laughs> Gotta right. be the yeah. same font. So yeah, right. <laughs> <I know. laughs> That's tough. That, that electric. That's a tough look. The damage. It like I did it. It was like my yeah. first cat. Let me just do this real quick. I think I, I got this. I got this, Brian. I got yeah. this. It would look exactly the same, dude. I, was, dude. I have a one of a kind of Kenny Florian tattoo. I'll dig it. Dude, dig Darren it. Elkins listens oh, to the Florian damage. podcast. I love him. But yeah, so if you don't know what we're talking about, just Google Darren mm. Elkins, the damage tattoo. It's a super fitting tattoo. If you know anything about the guy, but yeah, talk to Erica Bry because I do think that we could, we could come up with at least 15,000. If you'll get the damage tattoo. It looks so fucking good on the white, you know, <laughs> I can't. Jay, I can't. do you have anything else? Cause we got a lot of business to attend. Well, like what's go fucking no. going on with your hair, man. Jesus. Oh, we're not going there. We're not going. <laughs> Flo's, Flo's hiding his new fresh cut. Hey, enjoy the main event challenge, gentlemen. Uh, and we'll see you later in the week. Yo, the best fucking Jay. later. The best Jay. There he is, the COO <laughs> of the Anakin Florian <laughs> business and enterprise. All right. So, uh, Bri, as yeah. uh, you sit there drenched in Modelo, can we yeah. offer up a couple of pronunciations of the week as we spin this Ready thing for forward it. to uh, for UFC it. Fight Night, Nama Yunus versus Hibas. Now, we are moving this segment up this week. We were going to talk to you on Wednesday, so we appreciate you guys doing your handicap early. Uh, but later in the week, we're going to talk to Trey Ogden, and okay. he is fighting a guy whose first name is Kurt. Mm -hmm. Now, in Boston, we might call him fucking Kurt. Right. <laughs> so I need to know Kurt's last name as our first pronunciation of the week. So we've done this before and I failed miserably. So I believe it's Kurt Halibo. Pretty close. Cody, you want to bang that file for me? Look again. Kurt Halibo. Kurt Halibo. Yeah. So that is a repeat on the Anakin Florian I'm podcast. Ken Flo, I mean, he's still kind of. Kind of screwed it up. I, that's a yeah. yeah, that's a tricky one, though. Yeah, a little deceiving. So it looks yeah. like Halaba. So mm -hmm. we provide clarity, Halabo. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know my boss Zach Candido doesn't like when I do this, but I heard Mearshart this weekend, right? So obviously Ooh. our public service is not getting to everybody. Now right. there's a million talking heads who I could be throwing under the bus, and mm -hmm. if people want to go find it, then uh, power to you. Sorry, Zach. <laughs> All right, our second. <laughs> pronunciation of the week yeah. is Rose Namajunas' opponent. Now, right. let me preface it by saying sure. that 
Amanda, Amanda Nunez, Amanda, right? Yeah. I'm more worried about the last name, but let's sure. hear how you go through the whole thing, BP. And Johnny, I'm glad you gave this one because you know, you're know you an expert on names. I mean, you're the best in the business. And this one, I think I can teach you a little thing or two here. So with the with the last <laughs> name, you want to go heavy tongue and you want to really punch that S. So it's Amanda Heboth. <laughs> you can take that. I'm going to let you. I'm, I'm gonna give Cody, you a uh, let's hear Amanda. <laughs> That's Canada. <laughs> Amanda Ribas. Ribas. Amanda Ribas. She said it twice. She had different. She yeah, had she did. Both times. Yeah. yeah, different both times. That's uh, nothing easy about it. All right, well, we're going to move on here, fellas. But let me just say, not trying to be the pronunciation police in Kenflo. When he calls me the expert, anyone who knows Kenflo's career know that as a linguist, Kenflo is much Kenflo more is the great. expert. But I'm not an expert. I just practice, mm-hmm. right, yeah. to close up my deficiencies and I'll practice names as many times as I have to until I can show up with no phonetics, but nobody fucking listens to me. And I'm sure when I'm 60 years old, everybody's going to hate me. <laughs> Today's main event challenge is presented by DraftKings. Stay tuned because you'll hear more about DraftKings and all it has to offer throughout the show. DraftKings, the crown is yours. All right. So let us break down this featured prelim at lightweight between the aforementioned Kurt Hollibaugh, Kurt Hollibo, excuse me, and Trey Ogden, it's the Jim Beam talking. Trey Ogden, <laughs> Brian, minus 148. Kurt Hollibo, plus 124. So Ogden kind of got hosed his last time out, right? He had Nicholas Mata sus- submitted, essentially, but the referee, Mike Beltron, intervened too soon, goes into the books as a no contest. So uh, I got to think he's going to be of the motivated type here as the betting favorite. Your thoughts on the featured prelim, Brian Petrie? Yeah, I like this fight. You know, Kurt, he had a hell of a run in the UFC. He's, this is his third stint. And I think in, in the, the second stint, he went through the buzzsaw and just he was winning the Barcelos fight, got caught. Then he ran into Shane Burgos. And, you know, the kid, the guy's a stud. He's 37 years old, coming out of the old fighter. What does he do on the ultimate fighter? Oh, he just finishes everyone, finishes Austin Hubbard, who no one finishes Austin Hubbard. That's like a durable, tough kind of guy. He reminds me a lot of Trey Ogden. Trey Ogden, he's late. You know, he's been a little flat in the octagon, but he has the skills. His last time out was his best performance, and it got taken, it got taken from him, right? Took Moda down whatever he wanted, choked him out, strangled him, and outstruck him. This fight's going to be interesting because Kurt's pretty good off his back. He likes to play the triangle game. He has a pretty good choke. Um, Trey Ogden's been submitted by guillotine choke twice in his career by the same person, Thomas Guilford. But um, th- that's a possibility. Trey's very good on the ground. He's a good mind. He's an MMA coach, I believe. He runs a gym. Um, but I like Kurt here. I think Kurt is coming out nasty. He's 37, third stint in UFC. I don't think he – I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I don't know how realistic his title chances are. So I think the guy's going out there going, I'm putting it all on the line. I'm going for broke. His stand-up's good. He's nasty. He's a tough dude. I like the under in this fight as well, which is plus money currently on DraftKings Sports. I think we're going to get a finish, and I like the underdog in Kurt Hollibo. Cam Flo, Kurt Hollibo right now, plus 124, the recent Ultimate Fighter winner. And if you are only as good as your last fight, he looked outstanding, I thought, against Austin Hubbard. Submitted him at UFC 292 there in Boston. Really enjoy Trey Ogden just as an MMA mind, as a coach. He's 34 years of age, some uneven results in the UFC. What do you make of this featured prelim, Ken Flo, in the toughest division in sports? Yeah, uh, I think it's a real interesting fight between two guys that are very similar in skills. You have two Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belts uh, going at it here. And from a submission standpoint, you have guys, you know, in, in Holobo, Holobo uh, with 10 submissions, Ogden has 11 submissions, uh, more variety of submissions, it seems a little bit. Um, and when it comes to striking, I'd give the edge to Holobo just because he hits hard. He can he can put you on your ass and he can even knock you out. Um, left hook is the one that caught Burgos. Um, I think the right hand is where he dropped Hubbard. He, he drops people with both hands. Uh, so he's a good boxer. So in that boxing range, Ogden's really going to have to be careful. However, Ogden really doesn't play that boxing style range. He utilizes that jab. He uses a lot of kicks to keep you on the outside. And anytime you are in that range, he's looking to put you on your back. And I think that the guy who's able to determine the range, the guy who's able to win the wrestling is going to win this fight. And People are probably being like, yeah, duh. Um, <laughs> but I, I think that's going to be the case here with both these guys. So I don't know. With Holobo, uh, uh, you know, uh, that tough run aside, I see a guy who sometimes falls victim 
to some mental lapses in that fight uh, it, during his fights. And uh, not saying it's going to happen here, but if I have to rely on someone, I'm, I'm going to go with may, maybe the, the consistency of Ogden and how he fights. Um, I can see either guy winning here. I'm not too strong either way, but uh, give me Ogden here. All right, next fight for us to break down, fellas, at featherweight. Billy Corantello, minus 166. Yusuf Zalal is back. He is plus 140. So Billy Q initially was going to face Gabriel Miranda. Instead, the short notice replacement, and it's a guy UFC fans know pretty acutely. The UFC returnee out of Factory X, Yusuf Zalal. Ten fights in the UFC, Bry. Last competed in the Octagon August of 2022. A draw against Damon Blackshear. That was at Bantamweight. Now back at 145 pounds, your thoughts on him here against the credentialed Billy Q this weekend? Yeah, Zalal's flashy, man. He's got some skills. He truly does. And I think in his the final three fights that he lost, I mean, he lost uh, Toporia by decision. Not a lot of people can take that guy a decision, so that's no mark on him there. But in the Sean Woodson fight, he just didn't really fight like himself. He was hunting for takedowns and not letting his hands go. And he outstruck Woodson, and, but he was just... Not mixing up well enough. I think in this fight, he needs to strike. I think he needs to strike with Billy because Billy's going to put a pace on you, babe. Billy Q does not slow down. This guy's in your face, walks you down. Taking a short notice fight with Billy Q, you got to have a set of balls, man. And he does. He's like, fuck it. I'm back in UFC. I'll fight Billy Q. Billy looked great against Damon Jackson. Fight before that, though, he got caught with a knee against Edson Barboza, just rushing forward like he does. That worries me a little bit. I want to go all in on Billy Q. Um, he is my pick, but Bazal, uh, excuse me, Zalal has some great jumping knees and just a knee up the middle to stop a takedown. I think Billy's going to be aware of that. He's already felt that with Edson Barboza. Um, I look for him to put pressure on him. I don't know if he's going to get a finish, so I'm going to stay away from the props. I think Billy's low enough that we can make some money, straight money line on him. Um, I like Billy Q. Billy Corantello, Ken Flo, friend of the program, 6-3 and three in the UFC. I'm really interested, though, to see what Yusuf Zalal shows up here. He fought three times regionally in Colorado, won all those fights by finish, and now gets this huge opportunity. He's probably cornered 25 times in the UFC. As I mentioned, fought 10 times in the UFC and getting a name, so to speak, in Billy Q here. What are your thoughts on the featherweights this weekend, brother? You guys talked about Blackshear. You talked about Woodson. Have we forgot that this guy went to a decision against Tapuria and actually had some very interesting scrambles? He was able to get on top of Tapuria a few times, uh, had some really good exchanges on the feet. Now, I don't think that's the same Tapuria that we're seeing now, right? However, absolutely this guy has skills, Brian. I think you mm -hmm. nailed it. And he's extremely dangerous as well. Not ideal facing someone like Billy Q with that level of pacing and conditioning on short notice because it, you know you know you got to expect to go 15 minutes in your fight but 15 minutes of a furious pace that's what he has has to expect here against Billy Q my concern is you know Billy Q has been involved in like every fight win or loss is a war he's 35 years old and yes he kind of has had one to two fights per year since 2021 um, which I prefer, you know, if he was active three, four times during that year, I would be even more concerned. Um, but, uh, I don't know if Billy Q knows any other way, but to get in your face and just get after it. It's what makes him so exciting to watch, but it's also what will keep you on the edge of the seat going, man, I hope he doesn't get knocked out here. So it's really dangerous. And for me, I would have gone with the guy who, who was the underdog in this one. And right now it's the law and, and I'm leaning that way just because I, I think there's a little bit more value. Uh, you have a 27 year old facing a guy in Billy Q at 35. Um, if it was even odds, I'd probably be leaning towards Billy Q, but because, um, you know, I see some value on the here. Um, it, it's tough for me to say because Billy Q is so likable, awesome dude. But I, I think Zalal definitely has some value here. Yeah, like we might have Billy Q fill in for you on a future date that you can't host and you're fucking picking against him. Really well done. <laughs> yeah, uh, thanks, guys. <laughs> all right, Kenny, we're going to lead with you on the Bantamweights if we could. A couple of young guns here. Reno, Nevada's Peyton Talbot, minus 162. Cameron Simon comes back at plus 136. So Talbot came off the Contender Series Season 7. Won his UFC debut by Rear Naked Choke last November. Now he draws the talented young South African Cameron Simon He's got four UFC fights and three UFC wins before his 24th birthday. He is, though, Kenny, entering this one after his first pro loss to C-Rod Christian Rodriguez last October. How do you feel about the 135ers, Ken Flo? Well, we certainly know how good Christian Rodriguez is, right? And that was a close fight. Um, it was one that Simon thought he lost. I, 
I thought I thought Rodriguez should have won. I, I thought, you know, um, he, he, the right decision was made, but it definitely was close. And to me, what it showed was uh, Simon uh, Simon is a very skillful guy, man. He's good on the ground. He's good on the feet, um, has a variety of, of, of skills. He's very confident. And Talbot, you know, while he knows how to use good, good long range strikes and things like that, um, I don't think he has or has shown yet the experience um, or the skills to say that, like, yeah, he deserves this uh, minus 162 um, number here. Uh, I-, I think Simon uh, is the better fighter from what I've seen. Uh, he's certainly the more experienced fighter. Um, and I, I, he's also he was dealing with uh, ear issues, apparently. It had like a blown out eardrum or something like that, had a nose issue as well. So I think we're going to see a healthy Simon and a guy who really learned. Like I heard him break down his last loss against Christian Rodriguez, and he means business. This is a pro. Um, uh, so I like him here against Talbot. I just would like would have liked to see more out of Talbot. And um, right now, I think Simon's the more skillful fighter, and him at plus 136 is pretty juicy. Ken, that's amazing. Sorry for calling you Ken. You're just Ken, right? But <laughs> Call me Ken. I've sat down with Cameron Simon two or three times, and for you to have your finger in mind on the pulse of who he is is pretty impressive because you're absolutely right. The kid is all business and very skilled and has all of that mental, emotional, physical toughness that belies his 24 years on the planet. Brian Petrie, we need a selection, if you don't mind. Peyton Talbot, minus 162. Cameron Simon, plus 136. Ken Flo going dog hunting early. I love it. Back and back dogs. And we're disagreeing a little dissension. I love it. Peyton Talbot, this guy's interesting to me. I like, he gets energy from the sun. He strikes me as a guy that like makes his own uh, Sambuca and just tells everybody about it. He's an interesting cat. You know what I mean? Yeah. But he's got skills in the cage. He's really good. You know, I think Reyes Cortez, who we beat on the contender series, is a better grappler than Simon. I think Simon, Beth Pat Victory, maybe take it down. He's got good boxing. He's aggressive, but he is hittable. And Talbot doesn't slow down. This dude is, is just not nonstop. Very good. His level of competition so far hasn't been that great in the UFC. Uh, he's only one win, but Reyes Cortez, you know that he's 0 2 for the contender series. This is a big jump up. He's only 8 0, but I like his skills. You know, he believes in himself. He's some people say he's arrogant, some people say he's cocky. He believes in himself. I think he has some skills. I didn't know about the ear issue or, or, or some health issues. That kind of stinks, but I'm not going back on it. I think Talbot wins this. I think it's going to be a close fight. I think Simon's a dog. I listened to some of his podcasts. He's a smart kid for 23 years old. And that South African South African gym, that head coach down there, I'm, he's, his name's escaping me. They're doing something right. They're, yeah. th- those guys are really blooming right now. And uh, so this is a great underdog pick for Kenny. I just, my, my eggs are in the Talbot basket. So I'm going to go with Peyton Talbot. Let me help you out. Yeah. Mornay Visser Thank is you. the coach. Mornay Visser, yes, CIT. They got some talent, and they'll have talent beyond Duplessis and Simon in the UFC in the not too distant future. All right, at middleweight, Edmund Shabazian minus 198 versus AJ Dobson, who is plus 164. So interesting case for Dobson. He was going to face Treshawn Gore earlier this year. Big card, UFC 298. Gore pulls out late. So Dobson gets a bigger fight, bigger name opponent here, albeit on a smaller card. But he draws the one-time phenom, Edmund Shabazian, previously ranked fighter, uh, for whom the ceiling remains high. Brian, Shabazian yeah. about a two-to-one favorite this weekend. Your thoughts? Shout out Dobson, AJ Dobson, Ohio guy. Shout out Mark Coleman, who is uh, in Dobson's corner a lot of time. Obviously, he won't be there because he's too busy being a goddamn hero. Uh, so much respect to the legend, Mark Coleman. Uh, the line's off. I mean, Shabazian... Um, shouldn't be this high. Well, he hasn't had an impressive win in a while. He was all the rage. Um, I understand that AJ Dobson has had ups and downs in UFC. His last fight, he looked good, but there's always like a second gear you're ready for him to kick into. His grappling is good. His cardio, it almost like he doesn't trust himself. I don't know where that is. Uh, lack of preparation, lack of sparring, lack of training partners. I don't know, but there's a there's a moment in the cage where he doesn't trust them, himself because he's a big kid for 85. He can scrap. He has good cardio when it's tested, and he has good wrestling, which is a path to victory over here at Edmond. So I love the dog pick in Dobson. However, I'm pulling a Kenny Florian. Uh, I think I think Shabazian has to have this one. I think this is the training camp of his life. I've heard some rumblings of him in Vegas. He's a, he's a phenom. He's one of those guys we all know him. Uh, or we all know about him for MMA. They're a killer in the gym. And then when the bright lights show, they kind of fall off. I think Edmund needs a confidence boost here. I think his striking is fantastic. If his cardio holds up and his takedown offense holds up, I think he can be an easy work here. 
but that's a big if, right? Um, so the numbers below it. I'm not going to place a bet, but I will make a selection, and it's going to be Edmund Shabazian. Kemflo Shabazian still just 26 years of age. We were longtime high school graduates when this kid was born. He's five and four in the UFC, coming off the loss to Fluffy Hernandez. He has lost four of five on paper, although against good competition. Jack Hermanson, Nasordini Mavov, Fluffy Hernandez, Derek Brunson. I would agree, though, with Bri. Like this one against Dobson, he absolutely has to have. You think he gets a Ken or what? Yeah, listen, I, I think this is a fight. And no offense to Dobson here, but I do think this is a fight that is setting him up to go, here you go. Let's show me what you got, man. Show me what you got. Show me what you got. Uh, 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 so I, I think he can pull it off. I think he's the more dynamic fighter, right? I, I think his athleticism, his speed, certainly his knockout ability. I mean, 10 knockouts. Um, you know, out of his 12 wins. That, that is really impressive. Only 26 years old. I think this is a fight where he needs to show up and show us what he can do. Uh, D- Dobson's good. I, I think that, um, you know, he's good all the way around, but there's nothing that really, you know, stands out that says, like, he's going to win this fight. Absolutely. I think the way he wins this fight is, you know, taking Shabazian down, uh, you know, really letting Shabazian carry his weight and, and kind of winning it round by round, just grinding him out. Um, and he might be able to do that if Shabazian doesn't show up. But I expect Edmund to show up uh, and maybe get the win by KO or TKO. And by the way, an overdue shout out to the UFC Hall of Famer, the hammer Mark Coleman from Brian Petrie. Yes. Of all the great perks of my job, number one is meeting guys like that. I mean, what an absolute legend. The real article, super genuine guy. And uh, if you don't know the story, saved his parents from a blazing fire. Um, his poor dog passed away, but Mark Coleman on the mend and, uh, just a fucking elite human being of which there are many, uh, in mixed martial arts. All right. Co-main event in the UFC's heavyweight division, Carl Williams, minus two Oh five, Justin bad man, Taffa plus plus one seventy. This is crazy. Bri, right? Mm-hmm. Five weeks after his brother junior steps in for him. Justin returns the favor, returns from that knee injury in junior scheduled spot against Carl Williams. Williams from the Caribbean, from the Gateway Isle of St. Thomas in the U.S. Virgin Islands, 2-0 and in the UFC. This is a step up, presumably, though, mm-hmm. Brian, I would think, right against sure. Justin Toffa. What do you think about the co Tell you what, the bad man, Justin Toffa, better be polishing that 100% takedown offense he's got on UFC stats because it's going to be going after this weekend. Carl Williams is is an unreal athlete. I saw him fight back in Lexington against a Cincinnati guy, Jason Butcher. He got choked out. He got triangle choked. But, man, he is athletic. And then he's coming to UFC. The contender series, he's supposed to lose. He was fighting a Penn State wrestler, dominates him. And that's all he's, so, he's done in the UFC so far. He's so green, but he's with the right camp. And he's always going to be making improvements. And we look at Tafa again. He can put you out one shot. I mean, we all know it. This guy's a bad man. Great nickname. Um, but I just think he's running to a guy that's way more athletic. That's good to put him on his butt. They're good to put him down. We don't really see Toff off his back, or we've never seen him off his back. But, you know, not saying Carl Williams is on Tybora's level, but we all saw what happened when Ty got put on his back last week. And I think similar situations are going to happen here with Toff. He's going to get put down. He's going to get tired. Maybe a TKO finish later in the uh, uh, later in the fight. But right now, I like Carl Williams. And, John, we got to get this guy a nickname. You're the nickname king. So is Cody. Cody's very good as well. Carl Williams needs a nickname. Uh, we got to organically come up with that. But uh, I, I'm high on him. I'm high on Carl Williams. Well, it'll be something track and field related. And if you give me a week, I'll have a nickname for Carl Williams after the fight. I got to see how he performs. He was a good college wrestler, played college football, ran track. He actually ran for the Virgin Islands team in the pre-Olympic qualifier. But Justin Taffa, man, like it is so tempting. Thankfully, I'm not calling the fight. Like Mm -hmm. if this dude knocks somebody out just to be like, that's a bad man. (laughs) Just fucking scream it, right? Like it's so trite. It's fucking... I'm not even going to say it, but <laughs> he does have that undeniable death touch knockout power, mm-hmm. Kenny. Like he really, truly does. And I don't know how many dozens of fighters in the UFC, Ilya Topuria, Justin Taffa, they have it. But this is a big spot for him. You know, ninth UFC appearance. He's the underdog here. He's been a little bit up and down in the UFC. What are your thoughts, Ken Flo? Justin, bad man Taffa or Carl, no nickname Williams? Yeah, I, I had the opportunity to call one of Carl Williams' fights when he was in the Challenger Series in the PFL. And yeah, he certainly is a great athlete, uh, but he's a little bit older now at this stage of the game, right? 34 mm-hmm. years old, picking up this sport late. Um, and uh, for me, 
styles are extremely important. And for Carl Williams, although he does get the takedown and should try to look for the takedown here against Tafa, before he gets there, he likes to brawl. And the one guy you don't want to brawl with is Justin Taffa. And, you know, it's one thing to trade and stuff like that, but it, it, it tends to look a little bit sloppy for my liking. And mm-hmm. if your head, if your hands are dropping, if you're just swinging wide arcing shots and they're not straight, clean shots with you getting in and getting out cleanly, I like Taffa's chances here. Um, you know, I could see Taffa getting taken down and, and getting grounded out or maybe mm-hmm. TKO'd or something like that. But Carl isn't the greatest finisher in the world, in, in, in my opinion. Um and I think that against Tafa, you, you got to tire him out early, you know, and then maybe he can get a finish late in the fight or something like that. But I don't know. It, it worries me when I see Carl get sloppy out there before he looks for that takedown. And Tafa is the kind of guy who will find that chin or find that temple and take you out. And um, he's just a little bit too dangerous. And, and Tafa is... You know, he's not the most consistent dude uh, either, but, um, you know, on a, on a nice little win streak right now, he hasn't lost uh, in, in his last four fights. And I kind of like that number there. So give me Tafa. Have you guys seen the movie Billy Madison with Adam yes. Sandler? Of course. Yes. So there's a scene in which he's about to make out with that attractive woman. Mm-hmm. And I think Carl walks in and he's like, hey, Carl, good <laughs> to see you. Right. I have yeah. the clip. I'm just going to try to. Yeah. Good to see you. <laughs> so I think I have a nickname for What's Carl that? Williams. His nickname's Hey. On the hey. front end of his name. Oh. Hey, Carl Williams. That's <laughs> at least for now. But uh, we'll see what title. happens this week. All it. right. You don't hate it, Bri? I don't hate it. I don't. Right. I, we'll have to run it by him, though. I mean, if it's his <laughs> nickname. Hey, Carl. Good to see you. <laughs> Better All than right. Flow. <laughs> <laughs> There, you could have had so many nicknames the way you brutalized and bloodied and battered so many of your victims, and then you'd submit them, right? He's like, I'm gonna bloody you, and then I'm gonna humiliate you. Yep, main event in the women's flyweight division, former two time UFC strawweight champion, Thug Rose Nami Yunus, minus 205, taking on Minas Jadice's Amanda Hebos, plus 170. So, Hebos, seven and three in the UFC, pretty fucking good. She had a huge stoppage win her last time out, needed it against Luana Pinero, Pinero. Uh, but this is the biggest fight of her career, Brian, mm-hmm. right? First UFC main event, if I'm not mistaken, and it comes against the decorated former queen and future Hall of Famer, Rose Nama Yunus. Brian Petrie, lead us off on the main event. Who do you have? Oh, this is a great fight. You know, um, uh, it's tough because I like Kibath. You know, I like saying her name, obviously. I'm really good at it. Why, why are you doing speech impediment, though? Like, yeah. why you go and listen? No, no, I mean, you ever, you ever, it's from a movie. Sorry. I'm stupid. Oh, okay. It's he, uh, it's from pop star. Never stop popping. It's the lonely Island movie. Every time he goes, talks about anybody that's Spanish or whatever. He, he goes, oh, he God. does like a lisp to it. All right. And he has a whole song about it. Yeah. Anyway, that's, sorry. that's kind I of was what born I in 1978. Father. I'm sorry. Yeah. I say the same thing with RDA go half your So it's like, <laughs> that's it's right. Just one of those things. Yep. Um, anyway, I, I love this fight for Rose. Actually, you know, we need thug Rose to show up. We don't need this dilly dally. I don't know if I want to be here. Rose, we need a Rose to show up. She has grappled since her last fight, which was a close fight. She could have won that fight, but I just felt like, she was stuck in second gear. We won't bring up the Carla fight. No need to bring up the Carla fight because let's not bore people. But she has all the skills to get this done. She's very, very talented. But Thug Rose, that mean little 115 pounder that came out from the old fighter needs to come out here. He boss is coming off one of her better wins. But every time she has stepped up against the elite, she's fallen short. I mean, Aigas, Kenny like that one. <laughs> Caitlin Chikagian, you know, she's falling short of these elite. And there's not many. Oh my God. There's not many elite women like Rose. And if Rose is on and if Rose shows up, we're getting a knockout, I think, here because He Boss has been. I'm trying to keep him straight. All right. Uh, he Boss has been a little chinny. Durability is an issue. She's been put down. She's been put out numerous times. And Rose has head kicks. She has power. She has good punches when she's on. Not the greatest record lately. Former champion. I think she's got it. She's only 31. Thug Rose shows up. Thug Rose gets a KO. And we're we're uh, we're cashing out to the bank. <laughs> this is, I'm going to go Thug Rose. So, yeah. as our loyal listeners know, I sent Kenny a mug that says you're on mute. The only time I mute myself on this show is when you you get me going, Petrie. Yeah. I'm fucking diet over here with that Marina Rodriguez. I'm sure that... Uh, 
Cody will cut that as well as your Zlahal or whatever the fuck that I was. Bu- the I of Zlahal I earlier. Uh, Ken Flo, Rose Nama Yunus, Amanda Hebos, bring us back. Hello, FBI. I have a tip on a uh, named serial killer. Uh, his name is Brian Petrie. Just feels no remorse for any name that no. he sees and reads. Oh, God. Um, yeah, listen, uh, the, Brian kind of nailed it, right? I mean, it's like what Nama Yunus is going to show up. How motivated is she? I like the fact that she's taking this fight. I don't think she would take this fight if she didn't feel like she needed to prove something to herself. And I think this is one of those fights where she's looking to prove something to herself. Um, But, you know, that said, sometimes we never know which one's going to show up. You know, is it the one that's beaten Joanna twice? The one that's beaten Zhang Wei Li twice? I mean, it's like, I don't know. This is a tricky one. Um, But she didn't look great against, uh, well, I guess we could say the last two fights didn't look didn't look her normal self she's highly skilled she needs to make sure that she brings her skills into this fight takes uh control leads the dance in this one and she wins this i, I think she's more skilled here um he boss has some really good takedowns one thing's for sure he boss is going to come in here with passion and hunger and trying to win this fight uh she always brings it uh so i think this is one of those where nami Yunus has to absolutely show up or he boss is just going to out tougher and, and win it. So, but I'm going to lean towards the skillful fighter, uh, the more skillful fighter. I'm going to lean towards the more experienced fighter. Uh, and because this isn't one of those fights where it's like, this isn't for a belt or this isn't for a number one ranking necessarily. I like the fact that she's taking this fight because mm-hmm. I, I think for her, this is more one of those things. Like I said, I keep repeating myself. This is one of those where she wants to prove to herself that she still has it as a fighter. And I, I think she will respond well. Uh, give me Nami Yunus here. I love this main event. And how about the fact that Rose Nami Yunus twice beat Ioana Yan Jacek and twice beat Zhang Wei Li. Crazy. Granted, Crazy. one of those wins over Zhang Wei Li by split decision. Yeah. But uh, what a legacy for Rose Nami Yunus. And I do think a lot of the fighter that you guys are hoping to see this weekend, you will see. All right. We'll see how it goes in the main event this weekend. It is now time for Place Your Bets brought to you. By johnannick.com, where you can still get 20% off your entire merchandise order with promo code One More Sleep. We have launched all of our international designs now. Now, I shouldn't say all. We got Poland in the can and several others coming, but a lot of the international designs for One More Sleep are available right now at johnannick.com. All right, so Team Florian had the lead about $1,000 or so. He goes 2-0 and on his bets. So back-to-back perfect weeks for Kenny Florian for those keeping score at home. He had $400 on Gerald Merchart straight, $300 on Marcin Tabora straight, a plus 110. You had your bet on Angelosa, no action due to the no contest. It is a week of plus $538.33 for Kenny Florian. Year-to-date, over $1,000, 10-18-43. Petrie was at minus 545.82. He goes 2-1 and on the week. Also had that no action wager on Brian Battle, somewhat of a bad beat potentially for you there. Uh, but you did hit on GM3. You had a nice $300 whack on Christian Rodriguez. Did give $200 back with the shoey on tie to Ivasa. Nonetheless, you're in the black. Plus 286.25 for the week year to date, minus 259.57. Team Florian leads it by $1,278. You each have $1,000 to spend. UFC Fight Night, Nama Yunus versus He Boss. Brian Petrie, how are you spending your $1,000? It's going to be another clincher this weekend because Kenny and I are opposite in some of these fights, and these fights I'm going to place. He went to law. I'm going 500 on Billy Q. <laughs> Half my nut on Billy Q. I think he gets it done. <laughs> Give me, hey, Carl Williams uh, for $250 and then Thug Rose for another $250. Three bets. Nice. Right, three straight wagers for Thug Brian Petrie. Ken Flo, nice to see that black four figure number there. Who do you have for us this weekend? It's been a while. It's been a while. I've been uh, gigabanged by Brian Petrie for the last <laughs> couple of years. So uh, I need this. All right, here we go. Uh, Simon says, give me plus 600. Uh, so 600 on Simon. Yeah, I'm feeling confident on Simon, Brian. <sighs> Believe that. that. Believe that. that. And give me 400 on Nama Yunus. So nice that's done. it. Two picks. Quick and painless. Place yes, your sure. bets. Love Brought it. to you by JohnAnik.com. Check out Brian Petrie on the MMA Takes podcast. You can also follow him on X at Brian Petrie MMA. Hey, go get a shower, brother. I Not too it. red in the face. You got any buzz going or no? 
Now I'm feeling pretty good. I mean, I, I, I can't feel my legs, but that's normal. <laughs> right? I feel pretty good. No, I'm good, boys. I'm good. Hey, thank you, buddy. We'll talk to you next week, all right? I'll see you, boys. See you, dude. All right, Brian Peachy with us for the main event challenge and place your bets. Thanks to everybody for watching the show. Don't forget, you can subscribe and watch full-length episodes on the DraftKings YouTube channel. Selected clips on the Anakin Florian podcast YouTube channel as well. You can follow the show on all platforms at Anakin Florian Pod. Check out the merch if you want to support the show at johnannick.com. Also, remember the show with Jason Anik and Bilal Muhammad every Thursday, including this one on the Anik and Florian Podcast YouTube channel. And you know what I'm doing after the show? I'm going to Kenny Florian Martial and going to watch some jujitsu videos. I'm not going to do that, but maybe you want to fucking do that. For the rest of you, we'll see you guys Wednesday. We'll be back with UFC lightweight Trey Ogden. Thank you to our guest, Brian Petrie and uh, Ray Longo for a few minutes there. We will talk to you guys Wednesday. Until then, have a great day and a better evening. Yo fucking later. Can't keep your hands on the bar, he's an open man, he's cornbread. Oh.